now time for us to have prayer, and if any of you would like to come and join me down front, this is the time to do that. You know, we are told, do we, how many of us really want to be like Jesus and want to spend our time with him? We are told that if we, we should contemplate the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes for an hour every day. If we did that, we would be changed. We would be like Jesus, wouldn't we? So let us pray this morning. And that those who can kneel, please do so. Our dear Heavenly Father, Thank you so much this morning for all of this family that has gathered together. Thank you for the blessings that you bestow upon each and every one of us. We are told we should pray without ceasing. And Jesus prayed all night, some nights. What would it be like if we would do that, Lord? We would become more like you, and that is what we want to be able to be like you here and to be able to go home with you when you come to take us, Lord. I pray a blessing for those, Lord, that are having difficulties. There are some with some major health problems. There are some who are discouraged, I'm sure. Bless each one here with what they need today. Father, be with the pastor as he breaks us to your word this morning that we might all have open hearts and open minds to receive you and to have the blessing that you have for us today. And we thank you for this blessed Sabbath day. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone's going back. Let's make sure all the kids stay up here. Can all the kids come up here? shopping for someone nope. have the, you ever when you see somebody shopping and let's say they have little little kids what do they usually have with them Child. a stroller okay why do they have a stroller okay so <clears throat> there was one time okay where Mom was gone, okay? And mom's birthday was coming up. So I kind of thought it would be a good opportunity to take his two girls, which were between about two and three at the time, and take them shopping to go buy mom a birthday gift. Now, I wisely asked them where they thought we should go to go shopping, and of course they wanted to go to the mall, okay? Well, the mall's big. And so I decided that I could do this, and it would be safe if I just went to one of those big stores on the end of the mall, okay? So we went into the mall, and one of the girls that absolutely loved shoes just wanted to buy mom shoes. So we looked in the shoe department, and I'm like, we are not picking out shoes for mom. <laughs> the other one wanted to leave the store to go look in a different store. And I'm like, we're staying in this store. And I didn't have a stroller because it was a mom's car. And so I went in, and I had two hands. 
two kids. I got this covered. We went around the shoes. We looked at everything. Until all of a sudden, I went to take this one shirt off the rack to look at to see if this would be a good thing. And I had one child that ran out of the store into the main mall, and the other one that ran the other direction towards the shoes. And I had this problem. I can't go both directions. So, which direction should I have gone? Which way do you think? You would go to her. Why would you go towards her? She's the farthest? Maybe so. So I chose to go out of the mall, I mean out of the store, thinking at least one is contained in the store. Okay? So that was the, I didn't have a lot of time to think about it. But that is kind of what I opted for. So I ran out, grabbed, was it you? Oh, okay. I grabbed Shayla and picked her up and then ran to the shoe department. <laughs> and fortunately, Alicia was there looking at a really shiny, sparkly pair of shoes. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, there were high heels, all right. Okay, so how important is it that we have the right piece of equipment when we do things? It's very important. So as Christians, what is the piece of equipment that we should have? Jordan, do you have an idea? No? Anybody else? What should we have as a Christian? Christian music, that's it. Christian music? Christian music, okay. Faith. 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 A Bible. A Bible. Okay. So we're kind of coming into Christmas time where historically in this church, what's the scariest part of the Christmas season when we've done Journey to Bethlehem? The cross. The cross. What? The Roman guards? Okay. So what do we have? Do you know in a book of the Bible called Ephesians? Yes. Ephesians. Ephesians... And who wrote Ephesians? This really good guy named Paul, okay? And he wrote about having an armor of God. And so he said, put on the armor of God, okay? And he said, if you have the armor of God, you can conquer against all kinds of evil. And he said to have... To stand firm with a belt of truth. Is truth important? So when you look at your belt and from now on, I want you to think about truth. Okay? And he said, a breastplate of righteousness. So when you put your shirt on, think of righteousness. Righteousness is how we're saved. That we become right with God. And then take up a shield of, somebody already said this one, of faith. 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 Okay. And what about a Bible? How about a sword? A helmet of salvation and a sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So the sword is the Bible, the Word of God. And then once you have your armor, then it says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Okay. So once you have all your armor, then we got to talk to God and pray. So next time you go to the mall and you're taking a very little one, take a stroller. I'm just telling you. If you don't have one, maybe you should buy one before you go, even if there's already one in mom's car. Um, secondly, as you walk into life, you... Put on your armor of God and be ready. And just so you all know, we did end up getting something for mom. But once I got both the girls, we went straight to the cash register and we bought the three things hanging right next to the cash register. And I kept the receipts and hopes and amazingly, 
God was looking out for us because she actually really liked them and didn't have to return it. So see, we should have just started there. So awesome kids. And thank you. Oh, you have something to, okay, go ahead. Shayla. I'm going to say a memory verse. These three things will last forever. Faith, hope, love. The greatest of these is love. First Corinthians 13, 13. Okay. Good job. Okay. Well, I think we just heard our sermon. Let's go home. Out of the mouths of babes, right? Absolutely. You know, um, probably uh, 10 or 11 years ago, uh, when Cheryl and I were in Washington for our second year, we came to, uh, we came to Journey to Bethlehem. And uh, I have to tell you, in spite of our tour guide's best efforts to tell us how to talk to the Roman centurion, I got picked, and I, I want to tell you that I was absolutely frozen. I couldn't remember for the life of me what I was supposed to say. <laughs> but I'm excited, I'm excited for this new opportunity that we have, and uh, I, I, want to, I want to tell you that uh, this morning, I, I already modified my prayer walk. I walked... I walked south to this parking lot, and I did a prayer walk around this church, and then I came into, into the church, and I prayer walked through the halls and through this sanctuary and in Kelsch Hall, and I encourage you to be praying that God will bring us divine appointments, and you know what? I'm praying for you to come tomorrow uh, or Monday, for, um, for an orientation for your own divine appointments, because I know that God wants to reintroduce us to this community in a rebound edition um, that, that will spread the story of Jesus and help people to, uh, to know more about what this is all about and what we're all about. Um, as I've, uh, as I've uh, shared before in a book called Unchristian, uh, uh, written by David Kinnaman from the um, uh, uh, what polls, uh, Gallup polls. Uh, um, he he said that the this was a poll that was done with non-Christians to get their idea of what Christians were all about. And the big takeaway for me was he said the problem with the Christian church today is that they've allowed themselves to be identified and defined by what they're against instead of what they're for. And the only, the only way to break down those barriers is through individual relationships where people get to know what a Christian is like. And I want you, I want you to just recognize the incredible opportunity. We have sent out 15,500 invitations to this community to come into our church and to learn more about what we're about. We're about Jesus and about the wonder of his love. And we have an incredible opportunity. I want you to be part of it because it's a divine appointment for all of us. Okay? Let's, um, let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this gathering. I thank you for each person that's here. And Lord, there are people that are watching far away. And I just pray for a special blessing for everyone who hears your word. I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Amen. You know, I'm not a natural runner. I, uh, I've often likened myself to a kind of a steam locomotive. <sighs> Yeah, 
You know, I, it, um, I, have, a, I have a friend who says there are, there's no wildlife when I get out there. All the deer and all the animals scatter because they hear me coming from miles away. I've often just watched a natural runner loping along uh, just like a, a, a gazelle, you know, and they're just, they're just moving in fluid motion. And I, I remember um, going up, uh, up the uh, trail on Multnomah Falls. Uh, I was introduced to that early on. And I'm just like, you know, and I, oh, look at that view. Let's watch that view for a while. You know, and, and, and then, um, then uh, made it to the top, and on the way back down, here comes this guy with these long legs, and he's running up, you know, this steep trail through the switchbacks, and I'm looking at him, and I, I, he's not even breaking a sweat, and I, you know, and he's just like this fluid motion, and I, I couldn't help it. I said, I hate you. But I had a friend, a pastor friend, John Wesselin, who uh, had run many marathons, and he, 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 he enticed me to, uh, to start running. And uh, he, he helped me to pace myself, and, and I, got, I got more and more proficient, and I made it up to, in this particular picture, this is a, uh, a half marathon that I completed. And that was the end of my career. I did, you know, I did other shorter shorter runs, but that was it. But you know what? I never, would have, I never would have undertaken that. Obviously, I had the physical ability to do it, but without the encouragement of a friend, I probably never would have started. And uh, so I'm grateful for that. And I never thought I would climb a mountain, but there was a man named Rob McNabb uh, who was an uh, elder in our, in our church, and he, uh, he encouraged me to start training to climb a mountain. And this picture is a picture of me at the summit of Mount St. Helens. And then we also went up on, uh, on Mount Hood. We were just going to do snow exercise. He said we really could have summited, but this is at about 9,000 feet uh, on, uh, on, on Mount Hood. Um, and uh, we, we kind of exercised and did different snow activities, how to check your fall and all that stuff. I never would have done that if it weren't for a friend who had skill and taught me uh, and encouraged me all the way along. And you know, he never criticized me, even though if you thought I was running with a... <laughs> you should have seen me climbing up the mountain at about 9,000 feet of altitude, you know. It was like, oh my goodness. But those experiences have, have, have been zeniths in my life in terms of recognizing that I could go much further than I ever dreamed. And those activities only happened because I had a relationship with, with friends who cared enough to share something that they knew I could do when I didn't. You know, that's, um, that's what our life is all about with Jesus. Because there are a lot of people out there who would never undertake the journey of learning about Jesus unless there was a friend who came alongside them and began to help them to understand more about what a journey with Jesus is all about. Right? And, I, and I, so I think of this coming week and what a great opportunity we have for coming alongside people who are curious to see a performance about the Christmas. You know, Christmas is popular, but there's something deeper about Christmas, and that's Christ. And we have this incredible opportunity. That's why I really uh, want you to join in, in prayer on this. So... The power of, com uh, of, uh, of encouraging community cannot be underestimated. This community, to be an encouraging community as people come in, and you, know, you cannot, you cannot overemphasize the importance of what Mark has brought up here, is that this needs to, this ha we have the opportunity to be a place where people can come and say, I would like to be a part of this. This is a place where I can belong. Because it's a deeply held need in each one of our lives. 
And it's so deeply held that one of the things that makes gangs in the inner city or in the suburbs or whatever, what, what makes gangs powerful is they become family to people who have no other place to belong and they feel like they belong to, in a destruct. How much more do we want to be that community where people come through our doors and say, I can belong here. But that happens when people take a chance and reach out to other people, right? And, and so think about the power of community. In ancient times, Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit um, to write about the spiritual conditioning of a race. I talked to you about, about starting out and doing a, building up to a half marathon or climbing a mountain. But there's a spiritual principle as well. You know, we have a starting point in our spiritual growth. And, and when we come alongside each other, we are helping each other to, in this journey. Because all of us are different. All of us have a different walk. We start, have different starting places. But when we come alongside each other and God makes these divine appointments, we have the incredible privilege of getting to know people who are looking for something more. And we have something to share. Our own life story, God's story in us. And so um, we start out in verse 1. And he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. So who are these cloud of witnesses? Well, the previous chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, is called the Hall of Faith. And it talks about all of these different men and women who lived in faith and gave an example of their lives. And, and some of the most virtuous, like Samson. What? Samson is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. Man, what a life. The big thing he's known about is at the end, he, he's blinded and he knocks down pillars and kills a whole bunch of people. But, but he had faith, right? He had a relationship with God. But, you know, that cloud of witnesses. But I, I want to tell you that if we think about it only as those people who are now dust, and their stories are really important, but I, I'd like to talk about the cloud of witnesses that we have experienced in our lifetime. You know, for me, I have very important people that God put in my pathway at just the right time in the right way to make a positive difference in my life. They are my cloud of witnesses. They journeyed with me along the road for a period of time and made all the difference in, in the, way I, the way I live, the way I understand God, in the way I connect with other people. The cloud of witnesses. You know, we all have those people who have made a difference in our lives. And that's what this community is meant to be, is a place where people can belong, where they can get connected, where they can feel like they are contributing in a significant way. Because the, the, the only thing that surpasses our need for relationships and getting connected with people, the only thing that surpasses that is the need to feel like you're doing something worthwhile. The, the, the feeling that you are investing your life in something meaningful. And, and good. We have that need. What difference does my life make? We want to answer that. We want to be able to answer that, that God is using me to do something bigger than me, to climb a mountain, to, you know, spiritually, to, to run a race spiritually, to do something of significance and meaning. We're, we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. But there's a divine tension in this, and, and I don't know about you, because um, I, I realize <laughs> that where I am today is not where I'm going to be tomorrow, and I have ideals that far stretch beyond the reality of my life. I am a work in progress. I am a bundle of inconsistencies, right? I am a contradiction. I am a mystery to myself and my own mind, Okay? I don't know if there's any, if I have any kindred spirits there, but you know, it's an amazing thing that, that we can have ideals far beyond where the reality of today is, but, but the beauty is, is that today is much further ahead 
than where I was 10 years ago, you know, because of God working in my life and in, in your life. And so Paul shares this next. Uh, he says, let us throw off everything that hinders. You know, we've got encumbrances in our life. In this, in this life journey, we carry baggage. We carry stuff. And, and some of that stuff is in this physical world, you know, where we accumulate stuff. And that becomes our security. We accumulate stuff in the bank. We accumulate stuff in our houses. We accumulate, you know, ju just different possessions. And we feel secure because we've got stuff. But sometimes that stuff becomes an encumbrance. You know, God wants to bless us with what we need for life. But what is enough? Is there ever enough stuff? I, I, love, the, I love the song from, uh, from uh, Porgy and Bess. Uh, and uh, Porgy sings this song. I got plenty of nothing, and nothing's plenty for me. I got no car, I got no mule, I got no misery. The folks with plenty of plenty got a lock and a door. Afraid somebody's gonna rob them while they're out of making more. What for? Right? I mean, that's what happens, right? Yeah. I mean, simplicity. We, we need... To live with enough and a divine idea of what is enough. Right? <laughs> Throw off everything that hinders. You know, the more stuff we carry, the slower we're able to go. And then he says, and the sin that so easily entangles. You know, mission creep happens. Uh, it, it's, a, it's kind of a military term, mission creep, is that there's an initial objective, and you plan out your, your pathway to this objective and what you need to do in order to accomplish the objective, but mission creep is when we begin to add to it, and we begin to be, expand beyond what the original mission was, and pretty soon everybody's saying, why did we start this? Where are we? What, what's this all for? We can have mission creep in our lives by that sin that so easily entangles us. You know, that we can, we can begin to come to that place where we wonder, why am I doing this? What, why did I get started on this? Where did this? Where did this start? Where is it going? You know, there's the fog of war, basically. Mission creep in the spiritual life. It, you know, when... when We've forgotten what the main thing was in the first place to keep the main thing the main thing. And what is that? It's Jesus. It's that vertical connection that gives us the vision and, and, the, and the laser focus on the mission. And the mission is knowing Jesus and sharing Jesus. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Release, <laughs> release your addictions. Release all of these things to Jesus. And don't live in discouragement. You know, perseverance. This is a tough game. We, we were just talking in our, in our Bible study class earlier about bad stuff happening to good people, that evil is random. We, we face headwinds in our Christian journey. You know, I thought maybe because I became a pastor, I would live a trouble-free life. Not. You know, the fact is that the Christian journey is hard sometimes. Making the tough choice up front, knowing that in the long run, this is going to be the better way. Living the Christian life is not always easy. But it is, it is the straightest way. So let's, let's look at just a, a quick recap. Travel light and hold your possessions loosely. You know, that nothing is worth more than our relationships. Nothing is worth more than our relationship with Jesus. Stuff is stuff. Let it go if God calls us to let go of something. Hold it loosely. Travel light. Release your addictions and, 
and your distractions to Jesus are, you know, I don't know about you, but oftentimes my first response when I get dogged by something that just doesn't drop away is I beat myself up or I hyper-focus on it or I obsess over it. And what God wants us to do is look at him. And in, in my best moments, I said, thank you that this is not forever because you began a good work in me and you will see it to completion. When we, when we give those things to Jesus and recognize that he said he began a good work in us and he will bring it to completion, wow, does that release me from a huge burden. Those things belong to him. Let him take them in his time and in his way. Finally, don't, don't live in discouragement, but choose to live in the hope of Jesus' power in you. You know, we, discouragement, so everyone visits discouragement, but it's not the place you want to live. You know, it, it, it's overcome the best of them. It, it is enough. I am not better than my father's. Now let me die. That was the words of Elijah, right? We can, we can visit discouragement, but we don't live there because we have hope in, in someone who overcame the whole world. Paul, and, and this is one of my absolute favorite verses, when Paul talks about the ideals of knowing Jesus, and it's kind of that principle of where I am, but not where I am yet. We have these ideals. He says in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this. He's talking about where, you know, I want to know Christ, I want to join with him in his suffering, so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. And he says, not that I've already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, or have already become mature, or have already been made perfect in some translations, have already been made complete in some translations. That he says, but I press on, that, that but, you know, I haven't, I haven't made it yet, but... I press on to take hold of that for which, which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Who took hold of me? Christ Jesus. Did I take hold of him? He took hold of me. He is the great initiator. He started the process. He took hold of me. And he says, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, you can't change the past right? You can't live in the past. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about what he can do. It's all about Jesus keeping us out of mission creep where, where I get the idea that if I only do this, God will love me. If I only do this, I'll be acceptable. If I only do this, and we start taking on emotional baggage and stuff, because it's all about Jesus saying, I'll complete this work in you, and I'm drawing you heavenward. And you're where you are today, you won't be tomorrow, because I'm drawing you heavenward. Mission creep does not take place when we've got our eyes on Jesus and he says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer or the author and perfecter of our faith. What is our mission? The prime mission is keeping our eyes on Jesus. It's right in the heart of this passage. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, or the, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And pioneer is an interesting word because Jesus was the pioneer. He came into this world as a God-man, 100% God, 100% man, and lived in the capacity of a man to be the pioneer of faith. The first Adam failed. Jesus, as Paul talks about in Romans, is the second Adam who came into this world and lived the complete, faithful, perfect life. And he is our pioneer. You know, one day I was, uh, I was out doing uh, my prayer walk in Beatrice, Nebraska. It's not Beatrice. It's Beatrice because that's the way per they pronounce it. I don't care how you say it. The Beatricians say it's Beatrice. And, and um, 
There was this, they, they had put in a brand new soccer field at the YMCA, which was on my prayer walk, and a light snow had been falling. And this was the first year of that soccer field. And that, that snow was just absolutely flat and white and unblemished. So my mind says, walk on it. <laughs> so what I started doing was as I walked, I kind, of, I kind of walked like this. I walked looking at my feet and placing my feet one in front of the other, trying to walk this really straight line. And I was really careful about it. And then I turned around and I looked, and my path was like this. I was like, wait a minute. And, and then, I, then, I, then, I, then I thought, wait, wait, there was a light post out in the distance, and it was dark. This has still got light. It was, and, and I looked at that light post, and instead of walking in reference to my own thinking and my own, my own ability, I looked at the light post, and I just walked toward that point. And when I looked back, you know what happened. That was a straight line. You know, looking at Jesus, the author or the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, is walking a straight line because it's in reference to a point, and that point is Jesus. Jesus is the point. He keeps us from mission creep. He keeps us from these wild swings in our, in our pathway. Jesus is the answer. Jesus builds community. Jesus build, builds people. Jesus is the one that we want to share with others who are desperately looking for something real in their lives. He continues on in the second part of verse 2. For the, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you know what the joy set before him was? Not that he would, not that he would be raised from the dead, that you would be raised from the dead. Because of what he did, the joy set before him, the mission that he was on was that he would complete it and say, it is finished, and he had joy in, in that, in, even in the midst of that suffering, because you, 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 and me would be with him for eternity. The joy set before him. He endured un, untold suffering and difficulties. And, you know, for me, when I have good intentions and I reach out to do something nice for somebody, and then they turn around and they do something mean to me, that's one of the hardest things that I have to, have to absorb. It happens. But think about Jesus who made a whole creation for, for a whole mess of people that he envisioned before they were ever conceived in their mother's wombs. And he came into that sin-polluted world and they didn't want him and they spit on him and they tortured him and they rejected him and they mocked him. They, they did. No, not us. Because he did something superhuman. He said, we were worth it. He said we were worth it. You know, oftentimes we give ourselves this false idea, talk about mission creep, that we, are, we have value because of what we can do. You know, the world conditions us that we have value because I can do this and I can do that. I can do this for myself. I can do this for you. I can give you this so that you will like me, and, 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 and I have value because I am able to accomplish great things. When really, the, the lowest common denominator is we are worth it because Jesus created us, and because we are, not because of what we do. We do because of what we are. But we have to start at that point. It's who we are in Christ and what we do because we are in Christ. Yeah? 
Jesus is the ultimate witness. And then in verse 3, Jesus overcame so that we could overcome. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. <laughs> Consider him who endured all of this and recognized that it all had a purpose. And you know, I guess I could say then that when I suffer, when I suffer for, for doing something because of my love for Jesus, it has purpose. When I love Jesus, suffering is not without purpose. It's not meaningless. God uses even my suffering. Whether, whether my body is betraying me and my health is failing or I'm, uh, you know, I can't do the things I used to do because I'm aging or because I can't do the things I'd like to do because I'm still too young, it, it doesn't matter. There's always something that we want to be more of or less of. But whatever it is that we're going through, whatever struggle we have, not enough money, not enough, you know, too many bills... <laughs> All of that, God uses to bless us and to draw us closer to his heart and to give us a greater dependence on him. That's our opportunity to trust him, even with our suffering. Jesus is our champion. He is the one who prepared the way. He is the one who keeps us from mission creep. He is the one that makes our lives productive in a way that makes a difference in people's hearts and minds. You know, I appreciate Jesus. He has done great things in me. He's done great things for you. But he ain't done yet. Because this is a journey. And I want to encourage you. Keep on keeping on. Keep on drawing together, press together, closer to one another. Follow Jesus, and your line will be straight, and your life will be very, very good. Amen.